Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to episode 234 of Voices from the Bench. My name is Elvis. And my name is Barbara. What's happening, Barb? How are you this week? I'm great, thank you. Yeah, you, are you guys busy? Well, we slowed down a little bit, actually. Yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. Everyone getting back to school, I guess. Yep, that's what I was saying just 10 minutes ago to my son. Yeah. Mm-hmm. People have things to do and places to see and people to meet, and nobody's doing dentistry right now until the kids get rolling. Yeah, so. plus everyone's still doing the vacation thing. I think I heard that this Labor Day weekend was the biggest travel day, even pre-COVID. Well, you're pretty much in the know, so... <laughs> You're the one that tells me everything, so. Well. I believe it. If the internet knows, I'll know about it. I also know that you have a big old announcement, so how about you just give it up? I do. I do have a big announcement. For almost the last two years, I've been traveling the country, spreading my love for the Preet Corporation. And on the podcast. And on the podcast. It has not been a secret who I work for. (laughs) Now, while I still really like the parts and pieces... And I really, and I mean really enjoyed working with such an amazing group of people dedicated, not only just to the product, but to the patient. Yeah. Now, before I announce where I went, I want to give a big shout out to all the vendors in our industry with salespeople. I like that. I didn't realize how much time, dedication, and persistence salespeople put into their careers. I used to take for granted all the ones that took the time to stop by at my old lab, not really knowing the hours they spent driving to us, staying in not-so-great hotels just to be close to us, and the family they left behind to talk about, hopefully, a product that they loved. But after almost two years, the travel's gotten too much. Yeah, I can tell. You were traveling your ass. I'm I was saying. all over the place. I we recorded this podcast from all points of the country. <laughs> yes, you did. In every hotel possible. Helped your wife a lot. Just yes. saying. I love what I did. I got to visit labs. I met amazing dental technicians out in the world. I will always remember the good times, the great labs, and the wonderful people that actually took the time out of there, which I know is a busy day, just to talk to me. Mm-hmm. But that being said. During those last almost two years, I missed life in the lab. Heck yeah, you did. Yes, I did. Here's to that. I talk to you every week and people on this podcast all week talk about the daily organized chaos that is the lab <laughs> life. I miss yep. it. I miss working with doctors to complete a beautiful and functioning restorations. So, so what's up? I had an amazing opportunity to work with Derby Dental <laughs> Lab out of Louisville, Kentucky. Nice. Great people. It really Great is. Great people. I love Reed. All last week, I was at their amazing facility, meeting the staff and learning all about them. And now I'm even more excited to bring all that they have to offer up to the Indiana market by helping, consulting, showing, presenting, and just doing whatever I need to do to do the best job I can to help the doctors help their patients. Nice. So now you're on the other side. So you're going to be out with clinicians meeting doctors. Yes. Yes. I've left what I used to call the dark side. Yeah. <laughs> but still, no ill will. Preet is still amazing. Their service is amazing. The parts are amazing. I left to do what I wanted to do, which was get back into a lab and see my family more, honestly. That's pretty noble of you, I just gotta say. It was a great experience. I would totally do it again. I can feel you tearing up. So, if there is a dentist in Indiana listening to this, hit me up. I'd love to introduce you to my new home of Derby Dental Laboratory. Congratulations, friend. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm ready to talk shop again. Yeah. So this week, I got to have a conversation with a denturist out of Alberta, Canada. Oh, here we go with the name. You ready? No, I got this. Ready? Luke LaRock Walker. Nice. Now, you missed this conversation, Barb. What the hell were you doing? I was doing something. I'm sorry. Stop doing stuff. I will. Luke is all in on the digital workflow. But even with all the advances and technologies, Luke still can't do it by himself. Enter Paul Imperius. He's an analog dental technician from the other side of Canada. 
Together, they are taking the whole full arch digital workflow to the next level. Luke talks about his experiences in school and being a denturist in that providence. Paul talks about what led him to the other side of the country to find a better lab life. But getting together, they both talk about teaming up and finding a way to work together to find a better workflow, making better products for their patients. Nice. We talk about scanning and printing and milling and full arch implants. I mean, they do it all. So join us as we chat with Luke LaRock Walker and Paul Imperius from True North Denture and Implant Center. Two dynamic teams have joined forces to rock the intraoral scanning world. Whitmix has added the three-shape Trios line of scanners to its line of digital solutions for the dental office. Together, this dynamic duo can get your dentist scanning, providing you the reliable scans you need for your lab work. If you're interested in learning more about helping your dentist, head over to tinyurl.com slash Whitmix Trios. That's T-R-I-O-S. Again, that's the word tiny, URL.com slash Whitmix, T-R-I-O-S. And as always, we appreciate your support of the podcast, Whitmix. Voices from the Bench. The Interview. I'm just going to go ahead and butcher your names right off the bat, Gitko. That's what I do for a living. <laughs> my, my name is Paul Imperius. And I'm Luke Lerockwalker. So we are excited to welcome to the podcast two gentlemen from... See how excited they get? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> excited to have on the podcast today from Alberta, Canada, Denturist Luke Lerockwalker. LaRock Rocker. Yep. Luke LaRock Walker. There we go. Yep. And his technician, Paul Imperius. Imperius. Paul Imperius. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having us. We're looking forward to it. How's everything in Canada? Oh, it's sunny and hot, and the sun is out, and we're enjoying the weather that it's summer because we know in a few months that it'll be 30 below eventually. And. Uh... <laughs> It's coming soon. Yeah. Yeah. Enjoy it while you can. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, Luke, I actually got to meet you at the Maine Denturist Association. Yep. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was a great show. And yeah. you put on a fantastic presentation about what you're doing in your practice. Thank you. Uh, which is True North Denture and Implants, right? True North Denture and Implant Center. Yep. Perfect. So, I'd like to kind of find out how both of you got into the industry. So, Luke, how'd you become a denturist? Yeah, so my story started, like, definitely growing up. My best friend, his dad, I was a dentist. So I kind of always had the dental influence in my life. Yep. I always kind of wanted to do something healthcare. Like, I like to, I always liked the idea of helping people and and that kind of thing. So when I finished high school, I did a little bit of university. Didn't really enjoy university. And I was just kind of doing sciences and you know, like when in high school, I always did really, really well. I never really had to try and had great marks. So then university was really hard. And I was like, I don't think I'm going to be happy doing this for like six, eight, 10, however many years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, because I had thought, you know, maybe I could do optometry, dentistry, something like that. So then I started like exploring other options. And then so my that same best friend, so his name is Connor Fairbanks. He's actually a dentist up in uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada now. So he did follow his dad. Yeah, and, yeah, and his one brother is an orthodont in orthodontic school, and then uh, his sister's a hygienist as well. So it's, oh wow, yeah, he trade. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, but his uncle was a denturist, so I actually didn't even really know anything about denturists. And then I went to school with a girl, and her dad was a denturist. So then I uh, started chatting with her, and then went and kind of checked out what he was doing up in Edmonton. That's where I kind of grew up. Mm-hmm. And then applied and got into school. And it, like, honestly, I, you know, I definitely wouldn't trade it because, you know, I really like working with my hands. So, you know, getting to learn the lab side of things as well as the clinical side was great. And the other thing I notice now is in our industry, it seems like dental offices tend to be open kind of like uh, Starbucks and McDonald's. You know, they're open every morning, every evening, every weekend. Whereas our clientele is very, 
they don't want to come on evenings and weekends. They want to come Monday to Friday. So we get very, you know, reasonable hours. But yeah, you know, it's a very good lifestyle and I love it. And that's true for like denturism across Canada is that those hours or? Well, I know some people do the evening and weekend thing. And I actually did um, one evening a week for a while when I was playing hockey till like one in the morning. <laughs> and the next, yeah. So the, the day after I wouldn't want to work in the morning. So I wouldn't start till one or so in the afternoon and work till eight. And like, you know, the, the evening was never full. And yeah, like I said, most of my patients don't want to come. We do have some, you know, if they're still working and they don't want to miss a day, like we'll stick around, if, you know, sure. or I'll come in on a weekend if I have to. But for the most part, we just do regular hours and that's perfect. That's nice. Yeah. But your school, was it, you mentioned you got in, was it hard to get in? Is, is there a lot of people applying to get into these schools? Yeah. Like my understanding is such that, yeah, there's like at Nate, Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, when I went to school, there was 18 seats per year. And I mm -hmm. think they have a good, you know, two, 300 applicants. So yeah, it's, you know, fairly hard. Um, yeah. For our program, you don't need any university experience. So they basically only look at your high school marks. And because my high school marks were so good, I got in like right away. Nice. Yeah. And when you got in, did you find it difficult? No, uh, no. So what I what I kind of found in school was for any students that had done university, because I did do a year and a half. Uh, and then when I found out I got in, I quit my last semester because I was like, well, I don't need to do this anymore. <laughs> so like I found any of my classmates who had done university before, we all found it honestly fairly easy. Nice. Because the, the volume of material was a lot more similar to like high school where, you know, I could sit there if I, as long as I listened in class, I did really well. I think I had like a 4.0 and, you know, didn't really need to study a whole lot except for like medical terminology, oral pathology, those you actually have to just sit down and, yeah. but yeah, most of it wasn't. And I mean, I wasn't the best with my hands. I mean, I'd never touched a, you know, a lathe or a handpiece before. So that definitely took some learning, but yeah, no, like I said, I, I honestly found school not too bad and I really enjoyed it because I wasn't studying nearly as many hours as I was when I did university. So before you went there, you never got with any of your friends, families, uncle and started mixing some monomer and... No, like like I said, I did like a, it was one day or it was like an afternoon and it was just very overwhelming because it was like, I, did, I knew nothing about making dentures. I mean, there was, I remember there were nights where we'd go to my buddy's dad's dental office and he would take like teeth he extracted and he'd pour a stone into a little Dixie cup and set the teeth and he'd let us do like fillings and stuff. So a little <laughs> tiny bit of experience, but um, yeah, no, like the day that I went there, I remember the uh, associate that I was kind of chatting with, he basically was like telling me all the steps to basically fill out the paperwork for my school application. Cause they wanted to make sure you kind of knew what you were getting into. But I mean, I didn't know what final impressions were. I didn't know what a pin tracer was. Like I didn't know what any of that was. All I really remember from that day was, I think it was 10 o'clock. They always put on the prices right. I was like, <laughs> they were like, okay, turn everything else off. Price is right is on. So, yeah. <laughs> but you didn't care too much because you get to have people like Paul with you. Oh, yeah. And we watch Price is Right every day. We do watch Price is Right every day at 10 o'clock. <laughs> and let's make a deal right after that. <laughs> Let's make a deal. It's back on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, geez. Yeah, it's kind of come full circle for yep. me, I guess. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get into it, Paul? I mean, so I grew up in northern Ontario mm -hmm. and worked with my dad. So my father was a lab owner and I would have to go to work and hang out with him. So if I wanted to see him, because the lab hours, as you know, yep. are... Unlike denturist hours, we work a little bit longer. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> so Sundays was the only day my dad was not allowed to actually go into work because mom would say, no, that's time for the family. And But during the week, I would be missing him and I would go after school. I'd go hang out with my dad and I would make little cars and stuff out of the wax. And then I would, you know, mess up the plaster bench and plug up the plaster hole and all that. <laughs> yep. And eventually I got started on the cleaning the flasks. And next thing you know, I'm doing bite blocks. And next thing you know, I'm doing setups. And I think it was 13 years old. I did my first full upper and lower setup that went out the door. At 13. Wow. 
Yep. What's labor laws in Canada? <laughs> no, I was, I was, I was allowed to uh, sleep under the roof, and you know, it was inside. I was able to sleep, so I was <laughs> in that one. Yeah, so I got room and board at home. But yeah, I learned from my father patience. I learned how to deal with people and respect, and and it was very important to see that. And I remember Saturdays very fondly. Uh, we'd have 30, 40 setups lined up, and we would knock them off in a day, and. We go have a burger at McDonald's afterwards, and we just, you know, it was time with my dad, and that's what what I had. Was the lab just your dad and you? Uh, no, he had about five or six in the lab, so okay. it was it was a busy production lab. So my father, when he started, it was you know, right after the war. He came back from the war. He was in the Second World War. He was a POW, and he came back in the early '60s. All the dental technicians were starting to bootleg dentures for the public. And it was kind of the early onset in Ontario of the bootleg denturist type of movement. Yeah. A lot of the guys that were in the labs, they were like, oh, we're going to go become a denturist. It was all grandfathered in. They got their license and off they went. So before he knew it, like dentists were calling him saying, hey, Ken, can you handle our work? Can you take on our work? And I think he was up to like 20 man lab at in back in the oh, 60s wow. yeah. Wonderful. in a small town in Northern Ontario. So when he had this, it was a great experience. And I would, thought it was wonderful. It was a great way of lifestyle. And I thought, well, this is wonderful for me. I can work with my hands all day. I get to deal with people that I love and respect. And it was a good thing. So I eventually got my formal education at George Brown College down yep. in Toronto. Graduated from there with honors. And then I moved on, went back home to the family business, worked for a year as you're supposed to get so many hours. And then I went and wrote my exam. I got my license and went back. And I think my dad hung up his lab coat in 1999. I bought the company from him and uh, ran it for 20 years. And then I eventually came out to Calgary. It was a weird market in Northern Ontario, as most people probably know. Labs were struggling. It was a hard thing. The market's not there. And everybody always talked about oil in Alberta and doing well. And I've always always, always wanted to come out West and never really had the inclination. And then talked to my wife and uh, we said, yeah, let's do this. Let's move. And uh, she stuck around for a year just so that my son could finish high school and uh, we could move out together. And then yeah. eventually, actually the distance is what caused my relationship to actually fail. So I moved out here and uh, she stayed in uh, Northern Ontario with the kids. And eventually my son came out to school and we you know, we've just been doing this as, as best we can, right? What did you do with the family business? Did you sell it? Did you just shut it down? or really put it in a box, and I thought maybe eventually I'll open up again someday. I didn't know where my path was going. And, you know, here I am in my mid-40s going, all right, let's take on this brave new world. And I've never, ever had a day that I've woken up that I didn't know what I was doing the next day, and that was pretty scary. So when I moved out here, it was like, oh, boy, yeah, it's kind of crazy. And then um, I started working for a denture clinic uh, shortly thereafter with them for a few years. So you went from owner to employee. Yeah, it How was, was cool. that. <laughs> I just take my check, I put it in the bank, and uh, did you enjoy it? Not having to manage people, or it was a big change of lifestyle. And you know, I've always wanted to get back into the lab business. And then when Luke and I kind of came to each other, it was like, wow, this is crazy. Like I'm almost a boss here. Because Luke is an exception to the rule when it comes to an employer, and I'm not trying to blow smoke anywhere. It's just the fact that we work so well together is because we have mutual respect for each other in our departments. And he can do anything in the lab. He can, by all means, he can come in there anytime and do what he wants, but he just lets me do my thing. Cases are ready, they fit, and that's what works out well. And what I get from him, I get quality impressions, I get quality bite registrations. I get appreciation for what I'm doing. And I think that's where it makes a good connection between the two of us. And we're friends within the clinic as well as outside of the clinic, yep. which is also makes it a really unique relationship. And I was talking to um, a colleague in Southern Ontario last night, and he says, wow, you are so fortunate to find that position there. And I said, yeah, I am. But I've also been doing this for 40 plus years. And it's about flipping time that this <laughs> came to me, you know. <laughs> It's quite unique. And, and Luke and I have, we've developed the clinic in such a nice way that it's working beautifully for everybody. So how did you guys connect? I was actually working for one employer and I was working four days and a half a week. So I had a Friday afternoon off and I thought, hmm, I got to do something with my time during the winter. 
and you're used to working 70 hours a week. Yeah, like, I, I can't was, do I 34. Was, I was so <laughs> bored. Like, it was like, oh my God, I'm working half the week, you know? <laughs> so, I phoned Luke just to see because somebody had been advertising a position, oh, yeah, a part time. A different position. clinic in my town. Yeah. And I said, are you looking? He says, no, but are you actually wanting to work? And I'm like, yeah, I'll work part time for you. So then I think it started out Friday afternoons, then it went to Friday full days, and then it went to Tuesday nights and Fridays, and then Saturdays, and then when uh, it was time to pull the pin at the other place, uh, Luke hired me on full time and nice. took a combo. He never had a full time technician, so he was like, "Oh my!" Yeah, it was a bit stressful going yeah. from just me seeing all the patients and doing all the lab work, and I was working. Paul, I don't think Paul believes this, but I was working like sixty plus hours a week. <laughs> And then, uh, you know, now I'm bad and I show up like, just before my first patient and stuff. But yeah, it was a little bit stressful taking on someone full time right off the bat. And especially knowing, you know, Paul's experience and how much work he can handle. It was like, okay, we really got to ramp this up even more to yeah. keep him busy. Feed the beast. Exactly. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and thankfully everything's just worked out really well. It's been full time a year and a half now. year and a half now. Yeah, and it just keeps growing and getting busier and busier and life's good yep so luke let's go back you got out of school you obviously didn't walk out of school and open true north no yeah so what's that path to get you to open this practice so actually funnily enough i worked for my best friend's uncle for a year in calgary yeah so i grew up in edmonton and then when i finished school like there wasn't a lot of didn't seem like there's a lot of job opportunities in edmonton because back when i went to school there's only three schools in canada and nate was one of them Mm -hmm. And so it seemed like a lot of people would go to school in Edmonton for their two, three years, and then they would want to stick around, you know, they'd live there for a while. So there just wasn't, didn't seem like there's a lot of jobs there. Uh, And I always liked Southern Alberta because it's a lot closer to the mountains. I love to ski and stuff. And I had a, my sister lives down here. Sure. I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll move south. So yeah, I got a job with my um, best friend's uncle, worked there for a year. Uh, and it was really good experience because he's been doing it a long time. And then his other uncle's a dentist in Calgary. So they did all on four stuff together. So I got to see a lot of that very early on. Mm-hmm. And then so Cochrane, the town I live in, is like 15 minutes northwest of Calgary. And my sister used to live here. And I used to always come visit to go ski and go to the mountains and stuff. And I was like, oh, if I could ever work in Cochrane, like, I would do it in a heartbeat. And yeah, about a year into my working, there was a job posting for this True North Denture and Implant Center. So I uh, reached out. And uh, what it was is that my now good friend, Megan Scarson, and her and a few other dentures set up this office. One of the owners was working here part time. And then I think it was only four or six months into the clinic being open, I started and I was working here three days a week. And then for my friend Megan up in Airdrie two days a week, I did that for a year. And then she said, we really want this clinic to grow. So then it was like, we want you in Cochrane full time, which is great. That's where I wanted to be. So this was like seven years ago, maybe eight years ago yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. Started here full time. And then four and a half years ago, I bought it from them and then just kind of been doing my thing since then. And you kept the name. Yep. Okay. Yeah, because, you know, the, all the dentists, because again, when I came in, because the clinic was so new, like I went and met all the dentists in town and, you know, tried to build the referral basis. And, you know, I did all the kind of marketing stuff. So, yeah, I mean, kind of had built the name up from the start. And so just kind of stuck with it. Absolutely. Now, I was always the understanding that dentures couldn't do implants, but you're big into the implants. How does that work? Well, so, yeah, so it's a little bit weird. I don't know exactly how this worked, but in Alberta, the rules for naming your clinics, you, like as a denturist, we're allowed to use the word implant. So we don't actually place any implants, but we restore on implants. And in Alberta, Got it. we kind of have the largest scope of practice. So like I can actually remove healing caps. I can place abutments. We can remove and insert all on fours, things like that. And I know not everyone can do that. So yeah, I don't know who fought for that, right? But we're allowed to have the word implant in our clinic name, but no dentist or specialist is allowed to use implant in their name, even though they're allowed to place implants. So yeah, every now and again, I have the weird conversation with patients and they're like, well, your name says implant. Why can't you do the implants? And then I explain. I didn't do all the schooling and that's not in our scope, but so there's a number of clinics that have the denture and implant center in it. And yeah, it's just a, you know, an Alberta thing. I don't know if all the the other provinces have that, Uh, but like I said, it is definitely in Alberta. We, yeah, you see that in the names a lot. And Elvis, just so you know, there are dentures that actually will not do implants. 
So they're just strictly like dentures and repairs and relines. Yeah. And uh, the other unique thing is uh, seven hours west of us in BC, uh, their scope of practice doesn't allow them to do all this. So it's province by province, basically. And I think Ontario and Alberta have the highest scope of practice, both for denturists and dental technologists as well. So it's quite unique that way. And uh, even for treatment planning of cast partial frameworks, uh, we're able to do a lot more than just seven hours west of us in BC. Uh, they have to have dentists sign off. They have to have, make sure all that other we're good as long as uh, treatment planning has been done somewhat by a dental office. Yeah. And they're working in BC to change those rules to, you know, say, you know, in Alberta, they have this scope of practice. Why can't we have the same? And yeah. I assume there's a bit of a battle between the dentist and the denturist, you know, wanting to, you know, release a little bit of that power or control or whatever. But yeah, but that that's kind of why we have the the name with implant in it. Did that help you decide to practice in that area because you were able to do certain things compared to other providences? Like in hindsight, it definitely would have been, but I was born and raised in Alberta. So it's mostly just, this is where I'm from. Sure. But I mean, okay. I'm sure there are people that come out here because they see, oh, okay. Yeah. You know, the scope of practice is, um, you know, so large, I'm allowed to do, you know, more, more stuff out there. I don't know exactly, but I think our fees are a little on the higher side as well. So, yeah, so there's a few things that definitely makes Alberta attractive um, for denturists to come and work. Yeah. How many are in your area? Is it competitive? Well, so there's only one other denturist here in Cochrane. And then there are a few dental offices where the dentist will do the denture. So, yeah, sure. there, definitely, there definitely is competition. There's a lot of clinic, a lot of clinics in Calgary. There's Kinda... probably 20 clinics within a half an hour drive of us. Wow. In Calgary and any of the suburbs, like we're definitely a suburb of Calgary, like they're all quite saturated. If you were to move to a small town, you could, you know, definitely way less competition. You could do really well. Uh, and it's actually funny because I mean, a lot of my competition are my friends, like, like Megan, for example, she's only half an hour away from me. Sure. And like a student of mine is a half uh, that I had a few years ago. She's like a half hour North, a friend of mine that also knows Paul, he's like 45 minutes away. We have other friends in Calgary that are pretty close. So I mean, it is kind of competition, but, you know, it, you all do good work. There's lots of work to go around. It's a for. friendly competition. It's no different hey. than the lab industry, you know. Yeah. I'm friends with half the labs around here, so. Yeah, yeah totally. But they don't all have a paw. <laughs> they don't have a paw. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some do. Some definitely have a have a good Paul, and yeah, but uh, no, I, they definitely don't all have a good Paul, and that's definitely helped my work life balance a lot. <laughs> it's been really nice. <laughs> so, Paul, you came from production type labs. Did yep. you see patients before? No, I saw the odd patient. We had a chair in the office. Like I was a full service laboratory, yep. so we had everything start to finish, crown and bridge fixed. We did partials. The majority was removable for us. So the odd custom shading, the odd, you know, time I would have to see a patient. Um, we did have that facility within the clinic, within the lab. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, it, it's totally changed my outlook. And I don't think I've told Luke this yet, but I know my work has actually improved immensely with the clinical aspect being so close that I can actually walk in the room and see what the patient looks like with the denture in their mouth every time I want to see that. And that is a huge bonus. We've also set up a lot of communication between the clinic and the lab, even though it's five feet away. Um, <laughs> we have, uh, and I recommend this to every denture clinic and every dental office, get a Google account that is linked to your dental lab or to your denture clinic and have the photos on an old phone just automatically upload to that Google account. And then when I'm in the lab, I can pull up that patient, Mr. Jones, and say, oh, now I can see the midline was off and the teeth are canted slightly. And I can fix that immediately. And Luke doesn't have to actually say anything. He just says, check photos for adjustments. And then I look at it and it's like, yeah, it's right there. So to identify in the laboratory, when you had you know, 20, 30 cases coming in every day, it was hard for the dentist to take two seconds to even put the name on the script, let alone some <laughs> Questions. So yeah. there's no there's no discredit to the dentist. They're busy. They're doing their thing, or they might ask the assistant to do it. And she misinterprets what he said and puts down a two instead of two a, and then you're like, oh, now I got to do a reset and all those yeah. teeth. So there's a lot of communication. This allows me to oversee where I want to take that information now, and I can take the good, the bad from it, and and make it better and make my product better, which I'm very proud of. And when he's 
it's funny because I always look over to, why is Luke grinding? You know, what's he grinding now? And he's like, he looks up at me just with these eyes and he goes, it's just an adjustment. Relax. <laughs> it's like, okay. You know, because I get a little, like, I'm very proud of what I give him. And if the work is quality, he's happy with it and the patients are happy. And I think, you know, you just bought that Mercedes from the Mercedes dealership and you're paying all that money. And then the guy at the, the salesman says, oh, the door doesn't close properly. Let me take it to the back and grind it. Yeah. And I'm you can't do that with a denture and the patient can hear that. And it just drives me insane. That's just a pet peeve of mine. And I want to make sure that Luke doesn't have to actually grind. And uh, you know, what's really nice, Elvis is we just started with this mill machine that we got from Ivoclar and mm -hmm. uh, we did a couple cases and Luke checked the bite on one right after we just got it. And he looks at it, he goes, check this out. And I'm not sure if you're familiar, you obviously are is the PK Thomas technique where it's a uh, tripod contacts to fossa yep i've heard of it yeah yeah and then you know your marginal ridges you have one pinpoint contact both mesial and the distal and you get this nice occlusion so he brings the dentures in after checking with articulating paper and he goes check the bite and i'm like oh my god that's textbook <laughs> like it was crazy i couldn't believe like i have a really hard time getting that <laughs> analog and then here's this computer that's just nailed this thing Every and, time. And it's unbelievable, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, it's just, I'm an analog guy, true and tried, how many years, you know, 40 years. And then I come to Luke and he's like, okay, this is how we're going to make models now. And he's showing me my mesh mixer and I'm going, oh, man, this is not going to be a good day at work anymore. <laughs> and then eventually, you know, all the other new advents of equipment and supplies and software and everything have come out. And now it's like I can make a model in a minute and 20 seconds digitally. I can make a custom tray in about eight minutes digitally. Like, it's just, how can you do that analog? And the Damn. quality, yeah. you know, and can you put the name in the model the same way that the software does so that it looks perfect, right? Yeah. You use no digital prior to coming to True North? That's correct. And Luke, were you into digital before Paul joined you? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Where did you step into digital? Yeah, so my digital journey started uh, April or May four years ago. Uh, or no, sorry, it was March. So again, going back to my, my best friend, Connor, uh, he so he finished his dental schooling, and then he went down to do a general practice residency at Idaho uh -huh. State University. And then we're, like he played a lot of basketball. I never really played a lot, but I love sports. Um, so he was living in Pocatello. Uh, and then March Madness was going to be in Boise. And I was like, hey, what if like we buy tickets, I'll come down, pick you up, and then we'll drive over to Boise and go watch basketball. So he's like, okay. So then, uh, so I go down and then the night that I get there, he says, oh, I'm just, I'm still at the school. Come by, I'll show you around the clinic and stuff. So then he says, oh yeah, check out this stuff that we're working on. So he had this 3D printed mandible and then he had a stackable bone reduction and surgical guide for, it was either a two or four implant locator case. Yeah. It was all 3D printed. And I was like, what is, like, I, like, I didn't know anything about 3D printing. I was like, what is this? And then he was like, oh yeah, there's this free software, Blue Sky Bio. You can just design this. And then he's like, yeah, it just takes all the guesswork out of it. And I was like, oh, okay. So I remember, <laughs> right. Like, well, cause then I was like, well, what do you mean 3D printing? He's like, well, you just pour this liquid in here and then it gives you like a, object and i was like like how does that work how does that make sense <laughs> i remember like all night i was like up really late googling and like what is blue sky bio how do you resin printing and stuff so then i actually i found these any cubic photon printers yep and i think it was i think it was that night i found this facebook group and i think there was 15 people in it and it was like 3d printing and it, it was i don't know if you're in this group but it's rick ferguson's 3d printing group um and now I think it's like 10,000 members or something. Yeah. yeah. So I joined it and I found one of these printers on AliExpress for like 500 bucks and bought it. And then I went to a course in Calgary like a month or so later and I bought a lab scanner. Uh, like I just love technology. I like the toys and stuff. Yeah, so absolutely. Back, back then I was kind of impulse buying uh, and I've learned a lot since then. So yeah, I was like, I got a lab scanner, printer. And then what was I even, I mean, you couldn't even really do a lot with digital back then because it's like no labs were making frames off scans um the design software was brutal like there yeah this wasn't a lot but i was just really excited about it i think i started making custom trays uh zircon zan had free custom tray software yeah. so it was just like 
great. I'll take impressions, scan the impression, design it, print it. And, and again, you know, I was working a lot of hours. So I was trying to, you know, at night after the kids were in bed and whatever, I'd be on my computer learning a mesh mixer for hours. Yeah. Yeah. I have these slides of like creating a model to 3d print it used to take like 30 steps. And now with Meta, it's like eight seconds or something. Yeah. Like it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. So yeah. So I started like a long time ago. Uh, and then it just kind of developed and evolved. And then like I got a Medit i500 scanner when it got Health Canada approved. Uh, and then we got a um, Nextent printer. I kind of got those together. And then that was kind of when I started speaking uh, on digital denture stuff. And then I was playing with ExoCAD, got 3Shape. And so, yeah, I've just kind of gone. I, I mean, I probably had like six of those cheap printers at one time because a new one would come out like every four months. And it was yeah. like, I get that one and they're only 400 bucks. So I just keep buying them and yeah, it was a lot of fun. He has a problem Elvis. Yeah, we know <laughs> that's a serious problem. <laughs> we now have a sprint ray and then a Sega and the next. <laughs> yeah, wow. he, he went to a CPR course and he comes back with a printer. <laughs> he's, not gonna lie. he's calling me on the way back. Are you still at the clinic? I got a present for you. And I'm like, okay, what is it? He says, do you want me to tell you or do you want to see it when I get there? And I'm like, all right, come on. And then he comes and he's got this box that's bigger than a dishwasher. And he's like, dude, I got it for a great price. And I'm like, okay. And this was like two weeks ago. <laughs> How big is the lab in this building? Do you have room for all this stuff? Older and smaller. Yeah. yeah I bet. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now we have, uh, we have an actual printing station. Now we have one of the printers actually in the mill room. Yeah, we uh, had to build build the whole room for the milling machine and compressor, and we had to put a printer in there because we didn't have room anywhere else for yeah, it. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have patients sitting on printers? Well, it's actually quite cool because as soon as you walk in, you've got Shelley on one side, our receptionist. And then on the other side, you've got this glassed-in mill room, which is all soundproof. Yep. So here's this, you know, Cadillac basically in there running with its little beastly compressor. And you can see this stuff working. And it, we had one patient, we just finished him off the other day, and he saw that we were building this mill room months ago. And he said, what's going in there? And he's super into technology. He likes his old cars and everything. Yeah. Well, when my denture's ready, when we're ready to go on my final denture, because he was an immediate full clearance, um, I want mine made with that machine. And he just told totally, wanted to watch. Yeah. And he watched as he was getting his tissue conditioners and everything coming into the office every few months. And he was watching this process get built and built. And we finally just finished him off. And he was just so tickled that he was able to do that. We yeah. actually let him put the pucks in the holders and then load them into the mill for yeah. his actual dentures. Yeah. Oh, I bet you love that. Oh, yeah. he totally did. Yeah. He was right into that. <laughs> yeah. So, Luke, you did mention intraoral scanners. Do you yep. do you dabble into that, or you do everything traditional impression? No. So, I so I'm actually a key opinion leader with Medit. Okay. Like I said, I got my Medit i500. That'll be oh this month. That'll be like three years ago, I think this month. Yeah. So I've used Medit for a long time, and I got to beta test the new i700 wireless before it came out. Nice. So yeah, so with intraoral scanning, like for complete dentures, I still like border molded final impressions in custom trays. Like to yep. me, that's that's the best way. I you know I haven't done a lot of intraoral scanning edentulous, but now we're doing all our immediates and all our partials. We're basically everything's done with the intraoral scanner. Lower free ends can be tough, so sometimes I do have to do an impression, and then we can either scan that impression or pour the model and just scan the free end. Because what I found is like the partials that we're making from intra scans fit so nicely. I actually, I remember there was a case where I had to do a lower impression and I did an upper scan and the upper, upper fit perfect and the lower I had to adjust the frame. So now, even if it's just, you know, six anterior teeth, uh, Paul kind of bugged me and was like, you need to scan those teeth. So I, yeah, even if it's just a few teeth, I'll scan the actual teeth and then do the impression and then we'll blend the two together and they just, they fit amazing. They're yeah. awesome. Medit software actually allows you just to scan the impression without pouring it yep. and then it flips the image automatically for you, but it locks out where the teeth you had scanned intraorally, that's all locked out. And then you just add the parts of the sulcus that you need to add on. Yeah. And you do that with a handheld or is that a desktop scanner with the... Yep. So that's all the, in, that's all intraoral. And uh, yeah, and I mean, obviously, the big benefit of the intraoral scanner is patients who come in and they're worried about, you know, gag reflex and stuff. Like, sure. 
They love it. Yeah. And how did you feel, Paul, moving from working on stone to resin? You know, what's really funny is in the lab, in the wet lab, we would go through a box of stone and plaster, maybe a week, week and a half. Sure. And, you know, you got to fill up the bin, blah, blah, blah. So when we got our mill, it was actually Cinco de Mayo was the day that we commissioned it. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're all there with the lays around their necks and drinking tequila uh, in the room. I agree. Yeah, a great yeah. time. <laughs> and then I filled up the plaster and stone just prior to that. I have yet to buy another box. Wow. And that's three months ago. So I think... I think it's working. <laughs> going digital was pretty scary. Like, I'm always trying to find a unique way to to hack the machine so that we can do even more with it. And right now, milling in the machine is an all-on case that we're doing a temporary situation for. And I thought, well, why don't I just mill this, oversized milling, and get it done? He's like, well, try it out. So it's in there right now, milling. And, you know, we work through it. We figure out three shapes, little... Uh, ways of doing things and, and it's kind of neat and I've gone from a guy that knew zero about digital and now people are calling me and asking me to team view in on their computers and fix their problems so it's it's pretty cool it's rewarding because you you've figured it out and you you've mm -hmm. got that now however it's also nice because I'm telling Luke I'm going yeah we could do this this and this he goes what <laughs> he's, he's pushing the boundaries now yeah, yeah. and it's funny because like i remember some days i'll be in there in the wet lab won't even be on till like one in the afternoon because he's just sitting there plugging around on his computer able to dress nicer now because there's not all this crap in the air and <laughs> everything i get to wear nice shoes at work now yeah i guess this wow. is have his <laughs> with the computer in the morning yeah it's a totally different atmosphere now you don't have to scrape the floor at the end of the day no no no, no I, monomer smell really. I, I sweep the wet lab once a week Wow. <laughs> it's all that's needed, right? And it's quite nice, you know, and uh, the garbage, the plaster bin's not full. And it's just, it's nice. Yeah. We're doing our reline impressions, our, di our analog. We do our final impressions, our analog. But we uh, scan them. We don't pour them. Yeah, but they're done analog. Yeah. And, yeah. and then repairs. And then repairs are done analog. So those are the three things. So we figure we're about 90, 95% digital here. But the only way to digitize a repair is just to remake the thing. You have to make a new one. Yeah. 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 Sometimes Paul makes me pour him up now because he's like, I'm not touching that impression. <laughs> <laughs> now I have a student here. Now I have a student, so she's going to pour yeah, all the she impressions. She gets to pour everything. She has to do it all analog for school. <laughs> you mentioned the P7. What made you decide to mill rather than print? Well, so like from my point of view, because I have been printing for a number of years and seen a lot of different materials, like I just don't think they're fully there for a long-term five-year prosthesis mm -hmm. and like, especially again I like I know markets can be very different like I remember my dad was living in Utah for a while and would send me like oh you can get an upper and lower set of dentures for like 999 bucks and whatever but in Alberta because dentures are quite costly like I I, I wouldn't feel good about giving someone eight dollars worth of material for a fifteen hundred dollar denture yeah so, and again, like, and, and those printed materials, like we haven't seen them long enough to know exactly how long they're going to last. And I mean, you always hear, oh, you know, in a few months, this is coming out, a few months that's coming out. And I used to get really excited about that. And now I know I'll believe it when it's in my hand and I can yeah. actually on it. I mean, I think additive manufacturing is the future, but right now with milling, because it's materials we've already used, they're tried and tested. You don't have that concern. That's kind of why we went that route. I mean, the milling's way more expensive, obviously. But like I said, to me, those materials are tried and true. They look beautiful. They're strong. They fit. I mean, it. they do everything we need to do. And then the, like, basically the one reason I decided to go the Ivoclar PM7 route is the oversized milling, where you can mill them, put it back in, and then it finishes everything up once they're bonded together. I wasn't even looking at any other machines unless they could do that because I had done cases where I had the base milled, had the teeth milled, they sent it to me and I had to bond it. And then it was just a pain in the ass to bond it together, clean yeah. everything up. Like it just was like, that's way too much work. PM7, it just comes out, it's perfect. Like such little after. So Paul, do you agree that it comes out perfect or are you nitpicking this thing when you first started using it? So when I saw my first one, we had... Um... Other than the occlusion being perfect. <laughs> well, well, hang on a second though. So you have to control start to finish on a digital denture. So if you do proper preparation, you're going to have a good end result. And I know that with whether you flask something and do a good setup and you do a nice wax up, 
yeah, you're going to have a good result. But if you do a lousy wax up on a denture and you go and flask and pack it, it's not going to look that wonderful when it's polished. And the same is true with the PM7. So if you do a nice wax up in three shade, your end result is going to work. The occlusion is standard. Now we're expecting nothing less than the best. Yeah. And you can do that with the PM7. But when it comes to the waxing up, I've seen other people's PM7 dentures and I'm like, eh, okay. And when I first saw it, I was like, oh, this is awful. And I said, maybe I can make this a little better. You know, I can play with it. I can add some composite. But why are we doing all this extra work? Composite for our American oh, uh, sorry. listeners. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. No, I got you. Okay. <laughs> so if we do that, then isn't it kind of like defeating the purpose of trying to do something digitally? Our higher end stuff, we do a little bit of characterization around the buckle flange. Yep. When it comes to how we get to that mill denture, that's where we put in the extra work, the pin trace or the face bow and all that extra. That's where you get a premium denture. Yeah, no, I, I love the PM7, to be honest with you. I think I've done a few dentures that have been printed and, you know, we show some of the reps and they're like, oh my God, dude, this is beautiful. And I'm like, yeah, but drop it on the floor, it breaks. Yeah, but you could just print another one and... 30 minutes. No, you can't do it in 30 minutes. You can, you can just yeah. keep reprinting. And yeah. again, there are newer materials out. We haven't tried them all because I, again, I, it's like, well, you need to buy this printer for this material and I can, we can't buy any more printers. So again, I think that is coming, but yeah, but, definitely the, the materials we're able to put and get milled, whether we're using the Ivoclair stuff or now we're trying dense fly and some. Paul, you heard him say just now that he can't buy any more printers, right? You heard that, right? Well, yeah, yeah. And you know what's really funny about this, Elvis, is before this meeting that we had here, I said to Luke, I said, oh, they're using this program. Do we have that or do we have to buy a new computer? <laughs> and everybody's wrecking themselves well, laughing. Yeah. yeah. We, we have, have like five gaming laptops now for all our scanners and design. Yeah, it. <laughs> yeah it's a bit it's a bit ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the thing, Elvis. If, yeah. if somebody is on the verge of thinking about this at my age and they're saying, well, you know, digital, I, I don't think it's going to be here. So I said that 30 years ago. I actually said that. I remember my dad and I talking about it. And then I went in and I got into Nobel and I got a Piccolo scanner so that I could do Procera crowns. Yep. And I think that was 18 grand for the little Piccolo scanner, Canadian. And I thought, oh, this is kind of cool. And the crowns fit like a dream. And I thought, well, they're wonderful fit. But realistically, they were unsupported a lot on the size of edges. And you had to do a double scan. And it was yeah. like, that was kind of redundant to do that. There was problems with the system. And then, you know, there's, there's, uh, Nobel came out with their first, you know, 3D scanner. And then the second one, and then the third one, then the fourth one, then the fifth one. And it's like, oh my goodness, every two years, they're bad as iPhone. They got a new phone or a new scanner. Yeah. It's hard to kind of, well, I'll wait for something better. There is a lot of good stuff out there right now that's actually reasonably priced. And, you know, if you're a denture clinic here in Canada and you want to get going with digital, a hundred grand is going to get you set up to go. And are you going to use, that's not including a mill. That's just printer, yeah. a scanner, you iOS, can get for tabletop. If you, you can want. probably yeah. get enough of that. You don't have to spend the money, um, but you could consider it, right? And the advent of all this digital has not made our dentistry any better. It's just made it more accurate. It comes down to the user. Who's ever using it is going to make it better. Do you feel that you're producing the same quality? Oh, no, way better. Way better. 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 Oh, way better. Way better. The dentures that go in are a dream. Yes, I would love to put carded teeth in there because I think carded teeth still look better than a multi-layer puck. Mm -hmm. It just does. And there, there is the option yeah. to use like the Vita Vigo teeth, you know, if you want to use carded teeth. And my hope and dream is one day uh, with our PM7, Ivoclar builds in a strategy where we could, you know, for say a single arch, it would mill the tooth pockets. We could bomb the carded teeth in, put it back in the mill, and then it would just mill the occlusion in to make it perfect. You know, that's my hope and dream. So sure. maybe they will be there, but not quite there yet. Yeah. Have you done the pucks that have the teeth part of it? The Ivotion, I believe it's called? Ivotion is more of an economical, we found, uh, system. It's not really something that we want to utilize. And they also, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Avoclar line, and I don't want to say anything really because... Uh, we, well, we, we haven't we done a lot. Yeah, and we haven't done a lot personally, so we don't totally know. Yeah. Okay. The, yeah, sure. The lower line, entry level tooth line, and I believe the same resin is used in that. 
tooth line as is used in the Eye of Ocean pucks. And it is softer. You can actually grind it and it feels a little bit softer. But you know what's funny is we were using Ivo base system before for our analog dentures. And I had, a, I guess it was another office that asked me to process some dentures for them. So I did it analog and I had to grind a denture for the first time in months. And I'm like, oh my, this stuff is really soft compared to the Ivo, or sorry, the, the, pucks. Uh, the, the pucks. Yeah. Couldn't believe. And you know Esther out in the BC yep. that her and Luke were talking while they were in Maine. And she said out of all the dentures she's ground, she has one to break. Yet to one to break. Yeah, I think she said that she hasn't had a milled denture break and she's like 3,500 or something. Yeah, she's done a ton of them. Yeah, and, and like my thoughts with those those new uh, Ivotion pucks where it's the teeth and the base are together. Um, yeah, like I definitely see that, you know, it is something we could use. Yeah, my concern with it is it is the, the tooth material is softer than the other Ivoclar pucks. So yeah, maybe for an economy denture, you're also stuck a little bit within the boundaries, obviously, because there's those scallops that the teeth yep. have to fit into. And again, you know, may, maybe for like a higher production lab where you need to save time on the milling, because that's the biggest benefit is you don't have to bond the two together and put it back in. It just does one mill. Um, that would be great. But I mean, again, for, you know, our clinic where it's one practitioner and we're, you know, filling the mill, um, we're not at a point yet where we need to do that. Yeah. That makes so, sense. yeah, so I don't see that issue. And yeah, Paul just kind of pointed out, you know, all on X cases. And if you remember James's lecture in Maine, those are the dentures he's using for their conversions. Yeah. And yeah, it would be awesome because they would be crazy strong. It's like one solid piece. And I'm like, yeah, that actually is a great idea. That would be amazing for those temps that you convert on the day of surgery. Yeah, so I definitely think there is use for that. Um, and if they make one that does have, you know, the same tooth material as their other multi-layer pucks and stuff, yeah, I'd totally be game to do more of them. But sure. yeah. Well, you mentioned all on X. How many of those are you doing? Quite a few? I don't do a ton. I would say every couple months probably we do one. And we have a few that we're working on right now. I don't know. I'm definitely not a salesperson in the clinic. I, I always offer everyone's treatment if they want to do that. I'm not pushy about that. Yeah. I mean, I love doing those. Uh, you know, they're a lot of fun now. When I first started doing them, they were very stressful. I know it's quite complex treatment. But yeah, no, we don't like, I, yeah, I'm definitely not like there's other offices I know of that do do a lot of those. But uh, yeah, no, they're, it's really cool treatment. And then now we're kind of working on how can we do an all on X case, basically fully digital, you know, not taking an open tray verified impression. Um, so we're working um, with um, some friends in Australia on a new scan body called Tectonic. That's really cool. And some new exciting stuff coming out there. Um, yeah. And we have a great surgeon that we work with in Calgary and he's very talented and his, the work he does is amazing. So it makes the denture part quite easy and quite nice because he knows what we need. So yeah. He knows where to put an implant. Let's just say. <laughs> that helps yeah yeah, yeah. there's yeah. a few coming out the front of the face that yeah you're, you're like gonna, what are we going to do with this yeah. and when i go to the surgery for conversion he's asking me he's like yeah do you like where that is do you like the angle make sure everything's parallel like he's very he's like here move my arm put my arm where where you want it and i'll put <laughs> the implant in so yeah it's it's nice to work with someone like that who yeah. you know like we're all on the same level here where we just want to make you know do what's best for the patient so there's no gods in dentistry where we work no that's amazing Yep. So have you got into photogrammetry with the iCam or the PIC system? Well, so the idea with this tectonic thing is such that you don't have to do that because that's a, you know, that's another scanner we would have to buy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So the idea with the tectonics, uh, I think I'm allowed to talk about it. I don't yep, think we're, you are. yeah, it's all, okay. it's, <laughs> yeah, show the pictures we can't send it. We, we won't send this podcast to Leaf. <laughs> but, uh, so with the tectonics the like the reason it works is the scan bodies actually have like kind of wings on them so mm -hmm. basically what you do is you they you, look like the game tetris yeah like you basically you you the scan bodies you get them so they they come out the sides and there's all different shapes and sizes and then you almost connect them and then you bond them together you loot them together with like jig gel or you know what you would use for a verification jig yeah yeah, like a pattern resin. And then what you do is rather than actually scanning the tissue or the implants, you scan those scan bodies first and you actually scan them from, say, left to right in one scan. And then you open another scan and scan right to left. 
and then they overlay those because when when these intraoral scanners are scanning soft tissue between two implants, there's a lot of room for error. But yeah. when it's scanning a hard, solid object, yeah, I think he said the accuracy, they're getting under five microns from an intraoral scanner with these scan bodies. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, yeah, because their idea is, is like, yeah, if people don't have to buy these another extra oral scanner for, you know, 40,000 or whatever, you know, this could save. And yeah, and people who already have an intraoral scanner can do this. Um, yeah, so we're working on a case right now with them. And yeah, and it's like, I don't know, I think it's a game changer. It's super, it's a super smart idea. And then what you do is, you know, it's looted together. You take those scan bodies out. They'll design the model, send it to you, you print it, and then you can verify it. Yeah, that's your verification jig. You try it on your printed model. And if it fits passively perfectly, you're good. You can go ahead and fabricate your denture. And that was your open tray final impression. That's verified. And nice. that's their business model. So they actually do the model for you. And if you're designing digitally, they'll include the uh, camp, the nesting files for you, uh, dig- the DCM files for 3Shape or ExaCAD, whatever you're using. Yeah, so you'll, you'll be able to pull it into your software directly. Yeah, that's yeah. what Paul did. Yeah, yeah. import and you're done. And yeah. there's your models, boom. Yeah. Yeah, how do you get the restorative parts on that model? Are you just, do you have to rescan it with a digital scan body? Well, no, like like Paul was saying, so we would we print the model and then we stick our analogs in it. Okay. And then for the bite, I can't remember, do they send it with the articulation pins? Yes. So you can yeah. mount it with yeah. the articulation pins on your model? Yeah. Wow. But then because we have the the scans with the multi-units Paul just designs. And then, like he said, we're milling the temporaries right now. And then he can then screw those milled temporaries right onto the model and then verify, check everything. And then, yeah, I'm not sure if any labs are fully fabricating like a phase two all on X case without, without actual models. But again, this may start to lead a little bit towards that if they know the accuracy is there and everything's fitting. I would still say you probably want to print those models and check it because yeah. it's costly treatment. But yeah, it's just kind of new, uh, a new cool way of doing it. What have you gotten the patient appointments down to? Are you able to do, I mean, outside of implants and the all on X, but just like a denture, are you able to do it in two appointments? Well, you're talking about, yeah, regular. Yeah, I mean, so you can, you basically confidently could by using, you know, the old denture for the impressions and everything. Yeah. We don't do that because I like this in the past year, I was on a committee for like all of Canada coming up with definitions for new digital denture codes because we have these fee guides, but none of this digital relates. So we now had to come up with new codes, new definitions for like, you know, because a try-in used to be the definition was like a wax based try-in and now we're 3D printing try-in. So that technically doesn't fit that code. So we're coming up with all this stuff. So in Canada, when you're fabricating a denture, you have to do a try-in. So technically you have to do it in three appointments. Otherwise it would be some sort of, you know, insurance fraud or whatever. Really? Interesting. Yeah. 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 Just because again, if you're billing for that denture, that denture is defined that you've done impressions, you've done a try-in and an insert. Um, So if you skip one of those appointments, you're not technically doing that code properly. So, yeah. So, I mean, technically you can do two impressions. Um, kind of our favorite uh, workflow lately is the what's called the reference denture technique, or we call it the digipager. That's kind of the the hack what? name. Because <laughs> in so in Canada there there's what's called a Winnipegger, where you just basically take impressions in the patient's old dentures and a bite. You mount it, you set teeth, you try it in, and then you finish it. So that's like the old three appointment denture. Yeah. Um, so now I think it was probably Esther came up with the digipager term. Yeah. So you can either use the patient's old dentures, take the impression, scan it, design, print a try in and then insert because basically it's perfect every time. Um, but kind of my favorite way to do it is we'll go ahead and scan their old dentures. If like, say I made them five years ago, or if the extensions are pretty good, whatever. And then Paul will then 3D print me copies of that denture. And then they'll come back for impressions and then a try in and then an insert. So it's technically like a four appointment denture. But I like that because then I'm not in a rush on my consultation because they want to get started and I have to, I don't have enough time to properly take my impressions because I, I kind of practice slow dentistry. I don't like to rush things. I use regular set materials like I like to do a really good job. So I don't like to be in a rush. So this way we can get started on them. And then we can still, you know, follow those steps. It's still quite a quite a quick way to get the dentures made. You know, and when I came out of school, I was very like, we need to do prelims, finals, 
bite registration with wax occlusal rims, then a gothic arch tracing, then a try and then sure, it, sure, yeah, be big on like the six appointment denture. But what I found is, you know, even doing my best trying to make it not too big of a change for the patient, sometimes patients just could not handle, you know, that much, you know, whether just the impressions were that different from what they were used to, or I changed the vertical too much. So I honestly find since we've started doing most of our cases with this reference denture technique, patients are happier because they're like, yeah, it's like my old denture, but it fits better. It looks better. The teeth are sharper. Uh, You know, it's basically just an improved version and it's not this huge thing for them to get used to. So like I said, I feel like Patients are happier. I do less adjustments than I used to. So, I mean, yeah, when you're looking at, you know, should we be doing the six appointment denture technique? Technically, yes. But if this is, you know, getting more patients happier, I don't know. To me, it's kind of a better way to do it. Well, yeah, the patient satisfaction is 90% of what you're doing. (laughs) Yeah, it's not like in school where you're like, well, I have to get this good grade, so I have to do it this way. Now it's like, if a patient's happy, that's a successful case. To answer your question from a laboratory aspect, Elvis, if we started the patient at 9 o'clock on a Monday, he'll have his teeth by the end of the day Tuesday if we really want to. Oh, yeah, we could get it done. Yeah, Yeah. and that's what's going to Yeah, but I got to get the pucks in the mill at night. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's not, and that wouldn't be like crazy killing yourself. No. Because you would be doing other stuff while things are loading or printing or, yeah. yeah. And when we do, you know, if someone needs like an acrylic partial, which I used to hate doing acrylic partials, like, Probably 95% of the partials I do are cast metal partials. Uh, that was kind of just ingrained in my head from school. Yep. And now we're doing, for all our immediate partial cases, we're doing a, a temporary milled acrylic partial. And they're just incredible. And usually if I do the scan by, I don't know, noon, they'll have it the next day. That's amazing. Is that done on the P, P7? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, same so. same oversized milling and they're just they fit so well they're so easy to insert like they're just incredible and like i said i used to hate them and now i'm like i wish we did more of these because yeah. they're so they're so good now yeah. wow <laughs> that's awesome yeah, yeah no it's a good workflow for sure so luke are you ever going to go back to the point of owning a practice without a technician no definitely not <laughs> so oh yeah one thing i wanted to say like i can't remember when we were talking about this but like when paul was talking about you know should technicians learn the digital stuff? Like, yeah, Paul is now basically invaluable. Like if Paul walked away, like I would be dead in the water. And like, and if you had that technical training, any clinic that wants to go digital, like you could have a job anywhere you want because there's so few people that know it, you know, as well as Paul does now. It was like probably less than a year from you not touching anything digital to like he took he took on it all. He was doing the printing, the designing. Now he runs the whole milling machine. I don't know anything about how the mill works. <laughs> and he didn't know where the, button was. Know where the power button was. <laughs> uh, it was a, a printer I didn't get to learn on. So um, yeah, so no, definitely I wouldn't because again, so like when I was like my first five years of practice. I was doing all the patient work and then all the clinical work. And I was also working at a dental office a day and a half a week. So like Mondays I would work, I'd come in at like five thirty, six in the morning, work till one, drive to Calgary, work from two to eight thirty. And that was every Monday for like five years. Wow. Uh, so I would just kill myself every Monday. And then a lot, like two, three nights a week. Again, I, I would always, I'd get in early and I'd always go home at four so I could see my kids and that kind of thing. Kids would go to bed. Uh, and then sometimes I'd get back to the office eight thirty nine, work till midnight or one, and then get up at five five thirty and get ready and go back to work. So, like I said, now my work life balance is just so much better. Yeah, and that was the idea, you know, grow the practice to the point where I could afford to have someone do the lab work. And I mean, I miss doing the lab work. I love doing like sitting down, just you know, put Sports Center on, do a setup. Like I really enjoyed doing that. Yeah. But again, for the practice to grow, like I just need to see patients. So now, yeah, basically all I, I think I did one setup in the last year. Uh, everything you else is just, you just did a reset in digital. Remember? Well, yeah, I did a digital one, but yeah, but I mean, yeah, basically all I see is patients. And I mean, that can be, that's definitely a different kind of exhausting. Uh, you know, it can be mentally draining seeing, you know, patients all day, but the sure. best the old lady said on Luke. <laughs> <laughs> He asked, he asked one lady once, he says, how many teeth do you have late, uh, in your mouth? And the lady says, oh, I've got 14 teeth. And then she goes up to the front of Shelly and she says, 
was he asking me out on a date? Was that a marriage <laughs> proposal? Yeah, you want to know how many teeth I have? <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Oh, it's so funny. Some of the sweet ladies that we get through here, they're great. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. What a great hour. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I appreciate the whole story of the practice and the, Paul, your journey into digital. It's fantastic, man. If anything, you guys prove that it works. Oh, it does work. You just have to apply yourself and 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 be open to it. And be open to it. That's the biggest thing. Like, I've got people calling me saying, hey, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? I said, well, are you ready to actually change your life upside down? Because it's yeah. not going to be easy. It, it's yeah. painful. Yeah. Yeah. Three shape will drive you crazy and you'll be wondering why you're doing it. But once you learn how to not upset anybody on three shape world, then you can move through pretty quickly. And yeah. I was doing denture, full upper and lower bounce working probably 20, 25 minutes ready to go for wax up. And it was a nice setup, good quality, everything. And I think three shape with the model, with the articulating, with my setup, waxed up, ready to go for a try in. I'm about 20, 25 minutes now for full upper and lower. Wow. Yeah. That's how you guys can spend Thursday afternoon golfing. Well, that's exactly right. Yep. Yeah. I was yep. going to say, we can get a lot of cases through, and the mill, I mean, the mill is basically just another employee. Dude, he works all night. He works all night. We show up and the work's done. Yep. <laughs> nice. Gentlemen, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Elvis. Awesome. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. All right. Bye. 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 Have you unlocked your dental laboratory's potential through 3D printing? Well, with the Astiga, you can. Did you know Astiga has over 500 validated materials on their open material system? And it's growing every day? By harnessing Astiga's proprietary layer monitoring technology with its smart positioning system and its integrated internal radiometer, as a laboratory, you'll be able to produce any indication you desire. It doesn't care if you do models, splints, temporaries, or heck, even permanent crowns. Your investment will be future-proof with the Sega's rugged engineering, providing you with a fast, accurate, and repeatable machine with a reputation that is time-tested in the dental laboratory industry. If you'd like to learn more about the Sega's machine or the material offerings, please visit the website at asiga.com. That's A-S-I-G-A dot com. Or contact your favorite dental reseller. And we appreciate your support of the podcast, Asiga. A huge thanks to Paul and Luke for coming on our podcast and sharing your incredible partnership that you guys have created to service all of the patients that you must see every day. I'm really sorry, super sorry again that I was not available for the conversation, but after listening to it, I do feel a little bit better about the future of digital dentures. Some of our favorite stories are the ones where an amazing technician teams up with an amazing clinician to make wonderful restorations for patients. So if you are in a partnership or know of one, drop us a message or email us and let's hear your story and find out who else is accomplishing wonderful things by working together. Aww. What a nice story. All right, everybody. That's all we got for you. We will talk to you next week. See ya. Ha, 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 ha,